Good afternoon, oh, youth scientists. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah. I work in the education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And we're so excited you're joining us today because we have a great adventure planned for you. Now, if any of you were tuning in earlier with our uh, squid squad, we went on a whale watch, which means Dana, naturalist Dana, took all of our squid squad viewers out on a boat, virtually of course, looking for whales along our coast here. Now, you scientists, don't worry if you missed out because we're gonna join that crew on the boat. So what happens for whale watch boats, a lot of times they'll take two trips a day. So that boat came back after seeing a lot of really cool whales and we're gonna board that boat. We're gonna go out in search of whales, but we're not just going to look for whales. You are actually joining us in training to be a photo ID naturalist. Now, what does that mean to be a photo ID naturalist? So we have a program here at the aquarium where we have interns who join us. They go on these whale watch adventures with us and they take pictures of all the wildlife that we see. And they're not taking it just for the fun of it. We're actually using all those photos in research to help learn about whales and also to help protect whales and other wildlife out in the ocean. So if that's something that is interests you, stay tuned and we are gonna go on this adventure. Now, while we're exploring today, while we're learning about whales and learning about this photo ID program and some other conservation efforts that are being done to help protect whales and other marine mammals. If you have any questions, any observations, any thoughts you wanna share, we have this text line. The number is right here. It's 562-286-1838. So you can text in those questions, those observations, those thoughts, and Cynthia is gonna be taking your questions and Dana is gonna be behind me controlling what you see. Now, if you're watching this program after it airs, so it's not August, 11th at 1 p.m. You can email us your questions at this email that's right below that phone number at live at lbaop.org and we'll answer your questions through that email. All right, Ocean Rangers, are you ready to get started? All right, so think about if you're going on a boat, what kinds of things might you need to take with you? You might need a hat because it gets pretty sunny. I usually bring a couple jackets. I'm always cold. So I usually bring like a sweatshirt and then another jacket to put on and some snacks, obviously, if you're going to be out on the water all day. You can get kind of hungry, so bring some snacks and join us as we jump on our boat heading out in, in search of whales. So we're going to be setting sail. So here's a picture of what some photo ID interns might look like. So there's some other gear you might need. I kind of forgot. I skipped all that. So besides the clothing and things you might need to help you on the boat, you're going to need some stuff to do some research. So right here, what do you see? What is she holding? She's using a camera. So if we're photo ID interns, that means we're gonna be taking pictures of some animals. So we're taking pictures of whales, of dolphins, and any other marine life that we might see while we're out on the boat. And then right here, this intern is taking some notes. So as a photo ID intern, you're not only taking pictures, but you're also taking some notes like the location of where we see an animal. You wanna take down the time, the GPS coordinates of where that is. We're also gonna be recording what the weather's like, how the wind's moving, how the waves are moving, all these things so we can get a better idea of what it was like when we saw this animal. And then right here, we've got, this is Jackie right here and she's taking some other notes. And then we've got another intern here who it looks like they are taking some more notes. So a lot of note taking just to make sure that we know all the details of when we saw this animal. All right, are you ready to set sail? Let's go. So like I said, we are going to be looking for marine mammals, but mainly for whales. Now, let's take a moment and think about, oh, this is really pretty. While we're heading on the ocean, what is a whale? What features make a whale a whale? So whales are mammals to start, like us, which means they have five characteristics that they share with all mammals, which means we actually have things in common with whales. So think about what makes a whale a whale, or what makes a mammal a mammal? What things do we have in common with a whale because we don't really look like whales. Not all mammals look alike, but we share common characteristics. Now, one of those characteristics is this stuff right here. What's this? Hair. So mammals have some type of hair or fur. Now, it might be kind of silly to think about a whale having hair or fur, but whale babies are born with little tiny hairs on their rostrum. That's sort of their nose, the front of their head. They have little tiny hairs there. And then like a lot of human adults, they do lose that hair as they grow older and go bald. But at some point in their life, they do have hair or fur. So to be a mammal, you have hair or fur. <sighs> what else? Breathing. We use our lungs to breathe. So unlike things like fish and sharks who can stay underwater and they're breathing dissolved oxygen out of the water, whales are mammals. So they're using their lungs to breathe. So they're going to come to the surface. They're going to exhale and then inhale before diving back down again. So we have hair. We breathe air. We are warm-blooded. Think about your temperature inside your body. 
your blood is warm, which keeps your whole body inside nice and warm, and that helps your organs and everything inside work really well. So we are warm-blooded. All right, that's three. What else? So we have hair. We breathe air. We're warm-blooded. Think about what did you eat as a baby when you were born? What does your mom feed you? Milk. That's right. She fed you milk. So mammals feed their young milk, and whales will feed their young milk as well. Now, the milk that whales are feeding their young is a little bit different than the milk we drink. It's a little bit thicker, or a lot of bit thicker, and it has a much higher fat content. And that allows that baby whale to grow a layer of blubber, or an extra layer of fat, to help keep them warm in colder waters. All right, so we have hair, we breathe air, we are warm-blooded, we drink milk, and then the last thing. Did you hatch out of an egg? No, we don't hatch out of eggs. So mammals, they give what we call live birth. You aren't laid in an egg. A whale doesn't sit on the ocean floor on a giant egg until it hatches. They give live birth. So those are the five things that make a mammal a mammal. So whales are mammals. Now let's see if we're gonna have Dana put up a picture of any whale so we can look at what makes a whale a whale. So they are mammals, but take a look at this whale here. This is a humpback whale. What features are special about this animal that maybe other animals don't have? What makes it a whale? Let's look at its body. So its body is really big, but what's this thing right here? Got that number's kind of blocking it, but what do whales have? You might say fins. They're similar to fins right here. Here's that flipper. So for whales, we call them flippers. Now this humpback has sort of unusually long flippers. Their flippers are about a third of the size of their body, so they can be about 16 feet long. So those flippers, they're used sort of for steering when they swim. Now, what's really interesting about those flippers if we were to look at the bone structure inside that flipper, there's another difference between fins and flippers. Flippers have bone structures inside of them. And if we were to look inside that flipper at the bone structure, it looks very similar to our hand's bone structure. Very interesting. All right, so whales have flippers. What else? What are they using to power themselves when they're swimming? So if their flippers are used more sort of for steering, how do you think they're moving through the water? If you said, let's see if I can get it right here, their tail. So whales' tails are called a fluke. Oh, here's a good picture. Thanks, Dana, of a fluke. Now, we say they have two flukes because each lobe, here's one fluke, here's the second fluke. So two flukes. You can make a fluke with your hand. You have two parts. So they're tail flukes, and they move them up and down. So that's a characteristic of marine mammals, thinking whales, dolphins, seals, and sea lions. They're going to move their tails up and down. If you're a fish or a shark, your tail moves side to side. Whales move their tail up and down. And that's how they propel themselves or push themselves through the water. All right, so whales, they have flippers. They have a tail fluke. Now, we mentioned before about their breathing. They're using their lungs to breathe. But how are they breathing? If you said their nose, you're right, they have a blowhole at the top. So it's kind of like we take our nose and stick it on top of our head. And that is where they're going to be breathing from. Oh, here's a good shot. You can even see their nostrils. So whales have a blowhole that they're going to use to breathe, and it looks kind of like they're sending water up into the air, and they're sending a little bit of water, but what happens is the whale dives down and they hold their breath. It's kind of like they pitch their nose, so it's all shut like this when they dive down, and when they come up, think about their nose sort of like a cup or a bowl like this. So it's closed. When they come up, they're going to open it, so there's an opening here, but see this kind of curved shape? That's going to pick up a little bit of water. So when they open their nose and they exhale that sends the water up into the air oh here's a good shot of their nostrils so it's sort of like a little indent on either side and that catches a little bit of water and then the air inside their lungs is really warm and when it mixes with the cold air outside it turns into that big cloud of mist or smoke and that's what we call a blow or a spout and now that we're on a boat we want to be looking for that blow or spout because that's one of the ways we can find a whale all right so those are some common things on a whale's body their flippers their flukes and their blowhole. Now, we're looking for whales, but there are two types of whales we have a chance of seeing in the water. Whales are broken down into two groups, and it has to do with what they have in their mouth. So, a whale like this one right here, which is a blue whale, is what we call a baleen whale. Everyone say that word together, baleen. Have you heard that word before? It has to do with in their mouth. So our two groups of whales are baleen whales and toothed whales. So that makes it sound like a baleen whale doesn't have any teeth, and that's right. So I have a piece of baleen. I'm going to hold it up because it's pretty big. This is baleen. So this is what's in the whale, like this blue whale. This one's actually from a humpback, but this is what's in their mouth. Now, baleen is used as a filter. So these bristles are on the inside of the mouth, and they are going to be filtering out water, pushing the water out of their mouth. Oh, here we go. 
and they're eating tiny little things like krill and bait fish. So in this humpback we have here, this whale is gonna dive down, take a big gulp of water, and then they're gonna use their tongue and they're gonna push all that water out. And these baleen plates you see in their mouth are gonna be used to catch all their food, which are really tiny. So baleen whales are feeding on really tiny animals. Now the other group of animals we could be seeing on our whale watch are what we call toothed whales. And as their name implies, they have teeth in their mouth. So think of things like dolphins or orcas or sperm whales, they all have teeth in their mouth. So their food is gonna be a lot bigger. They're gonna feed on things like squid and larger fish, even some mammals, depending on the species of whale. So those are the two types of whales we're gonna be looking for is toothed whales and baleen whales. Now we're ready to get started looking at some of the whales and some of the research projects that we use all this information we gather when we're on the boat. But first, I have some questions that I'm gonna answer. So what whales do you see? Oh, great question. What whales do we see in Long Beach? Well, here's one whale. This is a tooth whale. This is a bottlenose dolphin. So we see a variety of both toothed and baleen whales. And there's a whole range of whales that either visit our coast, so they migrate for a different reason, and then there's some who stay here year round. Now, here's a good picture. This is the tooth whales that we see. We've got orcas right here. And then these ones are called Rizzo's dolphins. We have our bottlenose, we have Pacific white sided, and we have common dolphins. So these tooth whales, some of them are what we call our resident, where we'll see year round. And then some of them like uh, the Rizzo's we see less often are the Pacific white side. We only see sort of in the winter or the fall. Now here are some of the larger baleen whales we see. We have blue whales, we have a fin whale, we've got gray, we've got a humpback and another humpback. So these are some of the bigger whales we see. And these are the whales that we're really looking for when we're a photo ID intern. So let's talk about some of these whales. We're gonna start talking about our gray whale. So I'm gonna have Dana bring up a picture of a gray whale. So gray whales are one of the whales that we will try and photograph as a photo ID intern. Excellent. So take a look at this whale. Now gray whales, are really interesting animals. So they migrate along our coast, but they come here for a very specific reason. They're actually not coming here to stay. They're just passing by. So gray whales are found up in Alaska. So they spend a lot of their time in Alaska. And then every October, they start making their way down the coast all the way to Mexico. So think about it. They live in really cold waters in Alaska, and they're going down to really warm waters in Mexico. Why would they be moving from colder to warmer waters? What do you think they're doing? If you said something that has to do with their babies, you're right. So gray whales, they're gonna be making their way to warmer waters where they're gonna breed and then they're gonna give birth to their babies down in Mexico in Baja where it's nice and warm and that baby has a chance to grow its layer of blubber. So here we've got some gray whales on their migration. Now the gray whales are gonna use the coastline to help them navigate in that migration. And our coastline here in Southern California and in Long Beach falls right along that migration path. So we'll see them coming down south and then going back up north in that migration. Now this migration can be about 12 to 14,000 miles round trip. So that's from Alaska to Mexico and back. That's a really long migration. It makes it one of the longest migrations of any mammal. And we get to see them. Now, something interesting about gray whales. So in the 1950s, gray whales were listed as endangered, which means that their population numbers dropped really, really low. Now let's think about what are some threats that might happen to gray whales or to whales in general. There's a lot of things that could threaten their populations. And for gray whales, it threatened their populations so much that it placed them on the endangered species list, which means that their populations dropped so low they were at risk of going extinct, which means we wouldn't have any more gray whales at all in the ocean. So what are some of those threats thinking about? Predators, right? Predators are a big problem for gray whales, but they're a natural predator. So it's natural for gray whales to have predators, other whales, other toothed whales, or other anim larger animals in the ocean could be a predator to a gray whale. But aside from predators, there's a lot of human impacts. So impacts that we could have on these animals that place them on that endangered species list. Things like whaling. So in a lot of countries, whales were hunted for their blubber, blubber or for their meat, so for that fat. Humans, someone said humans, absolutely, you got it. Human impact. And there's a lot of ways that humans can impact these animals. So for gray whales, things like whaling, Things like pollution. So pollution can be a huge problem, not only for whales, but for all the animals in the ocean. And then things like shipping lanes. So here in Long Beach, we have actually two ports that sit side by side. We have the Port of Long Beach, and we also have the Port of LA. And together, these are, I think it's the second largest port in the world, having these two ports next to it. Now what that means to have a port is thinking about all the things you buy. If you're buying something on Amazon or from a store, a lot of that stuff gets shipped 
from overseas, from somewhere else. So it gets put on a big ship, a really big ship that has all these containers, and it crosses the sea, and then it comes to somewhere like Long Beach, Los Angeles. It gets unloaded, it goes to that store, and then it gets sent to you. So these big, huge ships, they travel a really long distance, and they have a pathway that they follow. And sometimes that pathway could cross the path of animals like whales. So shipping can be a big problem. Now, today, gray whales that we have here along our coast, we're happy to say they are no longer endangered. They were taken off the endangered species list, and they are now listed as least concerned. So we're not too worried about their population numbers here along our coast. And that's it, thanks to all these regulations that were put in place to protect animals like our gray whales. So there is the Endangered Species Act that protected all, and the Marine Mammal Care Act. So both of these protected endangered species, and it protected marine mammals so that these animals, you can't really touch them. You can watch them, but they're safe in the ocean from, human, from some of those human impacts, not all of them. Now there's a research project that's done with gray whales here in Southern California. It actually takes place in Palos Verdes. Uh, and it's this group called the called ACS, the American Cetacean Society. So cetacean means whale. So it's the American Cetacean Society. And they do a lot of research on whales. And they have a specific gray whale project. And what they do is there's a lighthouse on a cliff here in Southern California. It's sort of like a peninsula. They sit at that lighthouse starting, I believe, January 1st from sunup till sundown. And there's a group of them. You can train and join them. And they sit there with binoculars. And what they're doing is they're counting how many gray whales they see going south. And then they'll count how many they see going north. So every day from January, I believe until May, there is at least one person, if not more, sitting up on this cliff at this lighthouse counting gray whales. And they're taking it, we call it a census. So they wanna know how many gray whales we see passing by our coast. Now, ACS, this group doing this gray whale project was one of the first community science projects in California, maybe I think in the US even. So they are coming together all these people who are just have an interest in whales. So you don't even need to be, you just have to have an interest in these animals, join together to do some research to protect gray whales. Excellent. So that's one whale that we see here is a gray whales. And that's one project that's being done to help protect these animals. Now let's switch gears a little bit. And we're gonna think more about some of the whales that as a photo ID intern, we are using our photos and the research we take to help protect these animals. But first, we have a couple more questions that came in. So let's see. Bree, thanks for joining us again, Bree. What do whales have, or what do whales that have, ah, what do whales that have no teeth eat? Great question. So whales like humpbacks, like our gray whale here, like blue whales, they don't have teeth, they have baleen. So they're gonna be eating really tiny animals. Now humpbacks and blue whales, their main food source is something called krill. And krill are really tiny shrimp. They're only about maybe this big. And they're found an abundance in our waters here along our coast. So there's lots and lots of krill for these animals to eat. Now, gray whales, they have baleen. They have these plates in their mouth, but their baleen is a lot shorter and they're actually feeding on something called amphipods, which are kind of like little bugs that live in the mud. So they'll dive down, they'll kind of mix up the mud with their rostrum, with their nose, and then they'll take a gulp of that mud, push all that muddy water out of their mouth and eat all the little animals that they find living in the mud. So baleen whales eat things like plankton, floating animals like krill, smaller bait fish, things like amphipods. Great question. Um, and then, oh, what's all that brown stuff? So if we go back to the gray whale for a moment, it's a good question. So we talked about ways that we're protecting these animals, but let's talk a little bit about what it looks like when we're looking at our gray whale. So I'm gonna give Dana a chance to find that picture. But you might notice when we look at the gray whale, there's a lot of white and brown stuff covering the body of this gray whale. Oh, so here we're gonna see the whale feeding first. So I mentioned that the gray whales, they feed on amphipods. So this whale, look at all that mud coming out of its, muddy, its mouth. Oh, so maybe you're asking the brown stuff. So that is mud coming out of that whale's mouth as they're feeding. Now I was thinking you were talking about what's covering the body of the gray whale right here. So all this stuff right here, that's actually whale lice. Now that might sound kind of gross, but whale lice is different from lice that we have on humans. It's actually pretty good for these whales because these whales get a lot of dead skin cells on their body and that lice will eat all that skin off, helping keep their body nice and clean. So that's that brown stuff. But that other brown stuff coming out of the whale's mouth in that other video Dana had for us, that's the mud coming out of their mouth as they're feeding. All right. so back to what we're taking pictures of. So for our photo ID interns, one of the main projects that we are working on is identifying blue whales. Now blue whales are the largest animal on the planet. 
Not even the biggest mammal, not even the biggest mammal in the ocean, but the largest animal on the planet. They can get up to over 100 feet long, which if you think about a school bus, a school bus is about 30 feet. So it's over three school buses. So here's some footage of a blue whale. Now take a look. These animals are pretty magnificent to see. When you look at their body, they kind of look grayish blue, but we call them blue whales because when they're under their water, they're so massive. When you see the sun shining off and reflecting off their body, they look electric blue under the water. It's really a great thing to see. And we're actually seeing them right now along our coast. So blue whales will come here in the summer to feed, and then they'll move on to warmer waters where they breed. But just look how massive these animals are. So our photo ID interns are taking pictures of these blue whales, and we're basically trying to gather information on them. So we're tracking these animals to see if we see similar blue or the same blue whale year after year. Now, you might wonder how in the world would we find out if we see the same animal year after year? And that is where our photo ID interns come in. So think about it. you're taking a picture and you're getting pictures of all these whales you see this summer. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna upload all those pictures to a computer. And in that computer is a database of pictures from all the interns who took pictures last year. Picture like this. So this is the back of our blue whale. We've got their dorsal fin right here. And what do you notice right along here? What kind of stuff? Is it a solid color? No, it's actually got a pattern. And that pattern is really important because that is what is gonna help us identify blue whales. So you might be joining us on a boat, take a picture of this blue whale, upload your photo to a computer, and then you can see if maybe one of our interns from last year saw the same picture. And so we, our photo ID interns will do a lot of research trying to match whales to see if we've seen this blue whale before. I think we have some photos that kind of show the comparison of how we can identify if we've seen the whale before. So we want to really look for these sort of markings and patterns. So for different whales, we identify them with different features on their body. For blue whales, it's going to be this sort of spot pattern. We can also use the shape of that dorsal fin. Because most blue whales, they have their dorsal fin. It's on the smaller side. But every animal is unique and has an individual shaped dorsal fin. It could have a little notch in it. It could be a little different shape. It could be a little pointier, a little rounded. Those are all things we can use to help us find that animal. All right, so take a look. Now, this is tough work. It's not the most obvious or easy thing to see or to find, but we can look at all these spots we see right here. Let's look right here. I kind of see these two. They almost look like kidney beans or jelly bean shapes. Now, do you see those two spots on this whale? Right here. So that mark, those markings tell us that this is the same whale. And they were taken at two, let's see, this one was taken in 2011, and this one was taken in 2012. So we had interns on the boat a year apart photographing a whale that was the same whale. So we know that this whale, this blue whale, visited our coast twice. Once in 2011, once in 2012, could have visited more, but we know at least once this whale came to our coast. And so that tells us a lot of information about this animal that it comes back to the same waters to feed. So our photo ID interns gather all this information and then we partner with Casti Cascadia Research Collective, which is a big whale research and education collective or big group. And they're using some of the information that we're giving them. Now, one of the things they're using our information to do is I mentioned that shipping lane. Remember we have those two ports here? So we have these big ports and all these ships coming in and human impacts, they have an impact on blue whales as well. And what we were noticing is our photo ID interns were taking all these photos of blue whales, of other whales that we see in this one area where a lot of boats were passing by. So the boats have that pathway they're supposed to follow. And we noticed that that pathway crossed the pathway of our whales. Now, what do you think could happen if the pathway of the boats crosses the pathway of whales? Not a good ending. What happens is a lot of ship strikes, which means a ship accidentally hits our whale. So what we used our information, all this, uh, this information, all these photos, all this research that are, here's we go, here's a ship right here. So think about a ship that large crossing the path of a large animal. It's not going to be good for either one. So all this data that we collected showing that the pathway of the ships crossed the pathway of the whale actually got the port to move their shipping lane. And just by moving their shipping lane over a little bit, it reduced the number of ship strikes by a great deal. How cool is that? So that shows that the research that our interns are doing are, is actually helping these animals. We are working together with other organizations to help protect these animals. Now, we mentioned for blue whales, you can use a spot pattern. 
And I didn't mention, but for gray whales, we can also use the spot pattern on their body as well. And we also take pictures of humpbacks, another animal that we see here in Long Beach. But we use something different for the humpback. We don't use necessarily the spot pattern on their back. We're actually going to use the spot pattern on the tail fluke. So we talked about their flukes before. Remember, they've got one fluke, two fluke. And this is the underside of a humpback fluke. And this underside is unique to that specific humpback. Just like our fingerprints are unique to each individual, the humpback's print on their tail fluke is unique to that individual. And so our photo ID inter interns can take pictures of our humpbacks and see if we have humpbacks who are visiting our coastline time after time by identifying their fluke prints. Now, I've got some pictures of humpbacks. So we're going to take a look at my document camera and play like a little bit of a game, kind of to see how we identify those spot patterns. All right, so we're going to start with an easy one. This is one of my favorite whales to identify because I took a photo, not these photos, but I took a photo of this whale. Let's turn that down a little bit. Oh, that's up. There we go. So I took a photo of this whale one time when we were on a boat, and about six or seven months later, we were on a boat again, and I took a picture and I noticed it was the same whale, and I got so excited that I personally was able to identify. But take a look at these two pictures. These pictures are taken in different places. You can tell the lighting is different. The angle is different. But we know that this is the same whale. This whale's name is Snowflake. So Snowflake has that all white on either side of their fluke. But the, mar the sort of identifying marker for Snowflake is this scratch line right here. And so if we're looking for all these photos of different humpback flukes, we know that this, these two are going to be the same, even if they're taken in different locations on different days because of those markings. Now I'm going to add in another picture here. Do these look the same? Does snowflake match this one? No, they look really different, right? So if we were looking through all these pictures trying to find a match to snowflake and we looked at this whale, would we think they're a match? Nope, we know they're different. Now I'm going to put up another picture. All right, take a look at these two humpback flukes. What do you think about these two? Do they match? Do you think they're the same animal? The same specific humpback whale? If you said no, you're right, because their pattern is so different. So this bottom one, I'll put up another picture of this bottom one. So this whale's name is Chief. Now I think his name should be Googly, because it actually has what look like two little googly eyes right here. Kind of hard to see, right there. But, what? Oh yeah. That makes sense. Let me zoom in so we can see googly eyes. Chief's googly eyes, I should say. All right, take a look. Right there. I think he should be called googly because of those googly eyes, but Chief already had the name Chief. But anytime we see a whale and we can focus in on those two little circles, we know that that is Chief. So we can use the pictures of their tail flukes to identify individual humpbacks. And there's a lot of other organizations. There's a group called Happy Whale, and they are collecting all these photos, even photos that we've taken, and they track the whale. So we can use these photos not only to see if the whale has come to our coast before, but we can also track where that whale travels, if they're traveling up north, if they're traveling south, wherever they go. Because if we share our photos, if we all work together, we can help track these animals, which helps us learn a lot about them. All right, we're just about out of time, but I see we have one last question to get to. Bree wants to know how big are blue whales? Ooh, excellent question, Bree. Now, blue whales, they are, as I said, magnificent animals to see. Here's a picture of a blue whale. They are the largest animal on the planet. They get about 100 feet long. So think about, like I said, a school bus. It's over three school buses. So that's really long. And some other fun facts I like to share about blue whales, thinking about just how large they are. Their tongue weighs as much as an elephant. So just their tongue weighs as much as an elephant. Their blood vessels, so their heart is massive, but they have all these blood vessels that help send blood around their body. Their blood vessels are large enough that a small child can crawl through. Think about that. That is huge. These animals are just massive and they're really a sight to see. If you ever get a chance to go out on a real boat and see these animals, I highly recommend it. All right, you scientists, thank you so much for joining us, learning a little bit more about whales and conservation on the different projects that we are a part of here at the aquarium and that is happening around us to protect these amazing animals. Hope you, hope you enjoyed it.
Tune in tomorrow to learn about, I think, sharks and conservation. Let's make sure. Yes, tune in tomorrow to learn a little bit more about sharks and the ways we are working to help protect those animals. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a good rest of your afternoon.